Hope you have your Bible in your hand because we're going to be looking at a lot of verses this morning. We believe in using the Bible here at Northside. Feelings and opinions don't matter whether it's yours or mine. It's the Word of God is what we have to go by and I'm thankful for that. This morning I want to talk to you about the purpose of works. The purpose of works for the believer. There's a lot of confusion about works in the Bible, and there doesn't need to be any. So I hope we can clear this up this morning. i got three questions I want to ask you. First of all, the first question, are works required for a person to be saved into eternal life? There's the first question. Are works required for a person to be saved into eternal life? Second question, a believer, do they, if you are a believer in Christ, Will you do good works? Is that automatic? That's the second question. If you're a believer in Christ, will you do good works? Are they automatic? Third question. If you're saved, to prove that you're saved, do you have to do good works? Or you can put it this way. Do good works prove that you're saved into eternal life? Three questions. If you answered in the affirmative yes to any of those questions, you are going to have a problem, a real big issue facing up to the Bible scripturally. You're going to have some issues. When you, in your theology box, in your belief, if you said yes to any one of those questions, then when your theology box, your belief squares off faces off with scripture then you're going to find ultimately if you're honest with scripture that you're in error you say why are you bringing this up today because in the past few months i've met several people several people that had this kind of conversation with me they say i agree pastor john that salvation is not by works do we have a verse in the bible that says that well, we love to quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9 here. And you can turn there if you would like, if you don't know that verse. I, I was 30 years old and I didn't even know that verse was in the Bible because I wasn't a student of the Bible. But there's a verse in the Bible that says, For by grace are you saved through one thing, one thing, through one thing, through one thing, faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast now so can can God come anywhere else in the Bible and say that salvation into eternal life is by works when he just said that it's not by works will he ever do that no because we might as well just throw the Bible away if he ever says one time that salvation into into eternal life is not by works then he can never ever ever never ever come back in another place and say that it is okay so we need to settle that so the answer to that first question, are works, good works required in order for a person to be saved into eternal life? The answer is an emphatic no, no. Okay, so here's the kind of conversation I have. Several people have had this with me lately. I agree salvation is not by works. And we have a verse to go by on that, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But, 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 but. Now, when they, usually when they say but, error is going to follow. But they say if you're really saved, there's two things you can know usually errors come. If they say but, and they say if you're really saved, I automatically know, red flag, I automatically know, danger's coming. But they say, they continue to say, but if you're really saved, you will work. That's what they say. If you're really saved, you will work. But here I got two questions to ask a person that says, that if you're, that, say, that says works save you into eternal life, we know the answer is no to that, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And I got another question to ask, the same question to ask if you say that a believer will do good works if he's really saved. Here's my question. That's an interesting thought, but what's your basis for that? That's a good question to ask somebody who is in error in Scripture. That's an interesting thought, but what's your basis for that? Here's my second question that I would ask somebody that says, if you're really saved, you will do good works. In other words, they're saying you must or you're not really saved. They're saying it's automatic. Here's what other question I'd say. I'd say, what saith the scripture? 
What says the scripture? This come up a few weeks ago, and for the first time in my life, I was called an Armenian. I've never been called an Armenian before. Guess what? I'm not an Armenian, and I'm not a Calvinist. I'm neither of the two. An Arminius, an Armenian believes that you're saved by grace, that you, that God's grace pay, has paid for all your past sins, present sins, and future sins. They do believe that, but they use grace as a license for sin. They say, okay, since grace cover, has covered all my sin, then, then I can just sin and get away with it. Now, what's the problem with that? Can a believer live as they please? Yeah, any believer. You, you right now are living as you please. I'm right now living as I please. Any believer can live as they please. But can you live as you please and get away with it? No. There's consequences. As you heard me say in my prayer to the Lord just a few minutes ago, the consequences for a believer who sins and thinks I can get away with it the consequence is never hell you're because you're saved for how long forever the consequences are up many manifold other consequences you're going to incur the chastening hand of God you're not going to be useful in God's service you're not going to be serving the Lord as you should you're not going to be getting rewards later blessings now fruitfulness I can go on and on there is price to pay heavy prices to pay but I was accused of being an Armen Armenian because I said to this person that said, yeah, I believe you're saved by grace through faith and you can't do anything to earn it. It's not by works. They agreed there. But if you're really saved, you will work. But, and my response was, that's not true. That is not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. So I, they call me an Armenian because here's their thinking. Well, you're light on works. Well, when it comes to salvation into eternal life, yes. Because salvation into eternal life is, look, the absence of works. You or I did no work of ourselves in order to be saved into eternal life. Why? Because salvation is not of works, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I'm light on works when it comes to salvation because you can't work your way to heaven. But I'm not on light on works when it comes to a believer if you have salvation already, you're a believer in Christ. You should be full of good works. Amen? You should. I didn't say you must. You should be full of good works. But it's, it's quite evident through scriptures that every believer is not always doing good works. Watch here. Let me prove it. How many of you have trusted Christ as your Savior? Raise your hand. Okay? Put it right down. How many of you, as a saved believer... Always do good works. Always. Raise your hand. Well, then why are so many people saying if you do, if you're really saved, you will do good works? Well, we're going to look at some issues with that in a minute. But I am not light on works when it comes to service for a believer. I believe every believer should serve the Lord with every ounce of their being and do good works. Because scripture teaches that. We'll see this. But I know the real honest truth about me and you. And I can see it in other believers in the Bible. They don't always, a believer doesn't always do good works. And I was accused of cheap grace. In other words, well, you're saying that, that since a believer doesn't always do good works, then you, you, you're calling God's grace cheap. God's grace isn't cheap. I believe it's free. It's not cheap. It cost him his life. But... Here's what I want to get to. What is the purpose of works then? Because look, if we can do no works to save us into eternal life, then it ought to make sense that we can do no works to lose our salvation. If I did nothing to earn it, then I can't do anything to lose it. And if I did no works to save myself into eternal life, then I can do no works to keep myself saved into eternal life. And then I can do no works to prove that I'm saved. Why? Why? If I can do no works to save myself and I can do no works to keep myself saved, then I can do no works to prove that I'm saved because salvation is not of works. Pretty elementary. It's not rocket scientists. But how many people are going around saying, but if you're really saved, you will do works. And if you don't do good works, then you're really not saved. All over the place. But if you don't understand grace, y'all, when I walked in Northside, I would have said the same thing that this objector said because I didn't understand grace. I didn't understand salvation, and I didn't understand service. You've got to keep them separate. I was trying to jam the two together. So what is the purpose of works then? Do they have any purpose when it comes to salvation into eternal life? No. No. 
Galatians 2, is it 16? Knowing therefore that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ. Even we have believed in Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Works don't justify, declare anybody righteous. You could do a list of works to the mount to the top of the Eiffel Tower, and it wouldn't even pay for one sin. Why? Because it's the wrong price tag. Good works isn't the price for sin. It's death. Death. So, anyway, so what is the purpose of works then? If they can't save you into eternal life, they can't keep you saved into eternal life, and they don't prove whether you're saved into eternal life, what in the world are good works for then? Well, they have everything to do with service for a believer. Nothing to do with salvation. Everything to do with service. So, here's what I put. Works have many purposes to those who are saved. Notice I didn't say to be saved. I said to those who are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Good works are a choice for believers. A believer can choose to do good works, can choose to serve the Lord by doing good works. Or a believer can choose not to serve the Lord by not doing good works. It's a choice. You can go through the Bible and see a lot of believers who did good works. And you can go through the Bible and see a lot of believers who didn't do good works. But never once were they questioned whether they were saved or not, whether they did good works or didn't do good works. Because our works don't prove our salvation. Or otherwise, salvation would be by our works. And we'd have to be saved by our works, stay saved by our works, and maintain works in order to stay saved. That'd be ridiculous. How many of you would want to know that you have to do works to be saved, to stay saved, or to prove that you're saved? How many would you want to know that? Let me put my hand down. I wouldn't either. Because I don't think any of us would have salvation very long. Because I know there's many days that I go by and like, God, my, my works weren't very good today. I, I got, I wanna, Lord, forgive me. Help me do better tomorrow. Don't look at me funny because I know you've been in the same footsteps that I've been in. So I don't want anybody walking away saying that Pastor John says a believer shouldn't do good works. I didn't say that. Don't put words in my mouth. I say a believer because they've been saved by God's grace, because he spilt his blood down the cross, they ought to do good works. They should, but it's not a requirement. It's not a must. It's not, it's not a condition or it's not contingent that they do good works in order to be saved. It's for something else. So let's look at it. God greatly desires for believers who have been saved by grace without works to do good works as a believer. That's God's will for a believer. What's God's will for me as a believer? Do good works. Do good works. That's his will. That's what he wants for believers. But works are not automatic for a believer. They're not. They're not automatic for a believer. If works were automatic and prove salvation, then we must be able to answer these questions. Are you ready? You ready to dive into this? We must be able to answer these questions. If a believer must do works in order to be saved or to prove that they're saved or or you're saying that they will do works, it's automatic, then you're going to have problems answering these questions. Here they are. Number one, why, why does God have so many commands in scriptures to believers to do good works? Why does God have so many commands in scriptures for believers to do good works if it's automatic? If it's just automatic, why is he even telling us to do good works? It'd be automatic, wouldn't it? Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 8. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Y'all, that's salvation right there. Salvation is not of works. But look what Paul continues on. Paul, in verse 10, he's talking about service. service. For we, saved people, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works, which God hath before ordained. This is his will. This is what God always wanted for believers. Which God hath before ordained that we, those who trusted Christ, his grace without works, that we, say people, should walk in them. What's the in them? In good works. See the should? Did it say must? Aren't you glad it didn't say a believer must walk in good works? Because if a believer must walk in good works, then that would be, uh, that 
that determine your salvation, whether you walked in good works or not. But it doesn't. It says that we should walk in good works. Because the honest truth is, does every believer always walk in good works? No, you don't, and I don't either. But we should walk in good works. So there's a command for believers to walk in good works. But it's not a requirement to be saved. It's something that believers should do. And we'll see why they should in a little bit. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I told you I was going to run you through a lot of scriptures today because you need to be able to defend this. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And it's in specific in this chapter, he's talking to saved people. Saved people right here. Although his salvation is to anybody that will choose to trust Christ as Savior. But he's talking particularly to save people here. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, teaching us, saved men, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous, that he might purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous, zealous, zealous of what? Good works. Should every believer have a, a burning desire, a, a zeal to do good works? Yeah, if Christ spilt his blood for me on the cross, paid for all my sin, I deserved hell. I still deserve it today, but I'm not going there because I did the one thing that guaranteed me escape from hell. I trusted Christ as my Savior. Since he was willing to do that for me and offer me salvation, rich and free, with no strings attached, only upon belief in Christ, one-time belief in Christ, if he's willing to do that for me, then I think it's my reasonable service as a believer to work, 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 work. Roll up my sleeves and do as many good works as I possibly can do till the day I die. I should be, a believer should be. You notice the word up there in uh, verse 12 that we should live soberly, righteously, godly. You know one way to do that? Be full of good works. We should we should live soberly, righteously, godly as believers. We should be full of good works. But the honest truth is, believers aren't always zealous of good works. You know it in your own life, and I know it in mine. I won't, I won't be able to say, I'm always doing good works until I'm raptured and get my new glorified body. I guarantee you then I'll always be doing good works. <laughs> but until then, I know I've got an old sinful nature. So look at Second Thessalonians. So you can see scripture teaches that believers should do good works, but never, never, ever as a requirement to be saved or to prove they're saved. Because we'll see some difficulties with that in a little bit. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And look at verse 10. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10. Remember now, you have people saying that if you're saved you will work it's automatic and if you're saved that if, if you're saved you have to prove that you're saved by doing good works that's error it's not what scripture teaches so watch verse 10 second thessalonians 3 10 for even we for even when we were with you this command we commanded you that if any should not work neither should he what eat for we hear that there are some which walk among you <clears throat> disorderly when he says walk among you he's talking about believers walking disorderly among them for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly you ought to circle this next phrase working not at all working not at all but are instead but are busybodies now then now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they what? Work. They work. And eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Now watch this verse 15. Very important. Yet count him not as an enemy... But admonish him as a what? Brother. Can't be a brother if you're not saved. 
He says, you got a brother who's not working at all. He says, in, here's what you do. You count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So here he is not working at all. I think it's talking about physical work here, but you can apply this spiritually too. Because are there believers that are not serving the Lord, not doing any work at all for the Lord? Y'all, where I come from, it's... Yeah, there's believers that can trust Christ as their Savior and never serve the Lord, not work at all. But did Paul question whether this brother was, whether this believer was saved or not? No, he said, don't, he said, count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a what? So is he still saved? Yeah, but he ain't working at all. He's not doing any works. Paul never questioned whether he was saved or not, did he? Paul already knew this brother had trusted Christ as his Savior. That wasn't the issue. The issue was not with this person's salvation. The issue was with his lack of service. He was empty, 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 empty of service. He wasn't serving as a believer should. He wasn't working. So there's an example. How do you explain that? Paul said he was saved. He never questioned whether he was saved. Didn't even go there. He was questioning his service. Okay, here's another question I got for you. To those who say you, if a believer is saved, then he will do good works. Or his good works prove that he's saved. Here's another question that you're going to have to be able to answer. Why would Jesus say it's possible for a believer not to bear fruit? Why would he say that? Because have you ever heard this? If you're saved, you will serve the Lord. If you're saved, you will do good works. If you're saved, you will bear fruit. How many times have I heard that? So turn your Bibles with me to John 15. John 15. John chapter 15. Well, go to John 15, but I want to take you in another place first. Go to John 15. Hold your place there, but turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Multitask here now. I know y'all can do this. Colossians chapter 1. First. Look what... Paul has said, he's talking to the believers at Colossae. Look what he says. Chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, in other words, they were, man, they were just walking with the Lord, serving the Lord, doing a bunch of good works. He says, do, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That ye, believers, might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being what? Fruitful in every what? Good work. And increasing the knowledge of God. You want to be fruitful as a believer? Do you want to be fruitful? Then be full of good works. It's a surefire way. Sure, bona fide, guaranteed way to be fruitful. He says, be fruitful in every good works. That's what he said. That's God's will, his desire. And that's what Paul's desire and prayer for these believers in Colossae, Colossae was, that they might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Now go back, go to John 15, 8, uh, 15, chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me, every branch in me. Now remember now, he's talking about a vine and branches. Jesus said, I'm the true vine. And he says, my father is the husbandman. He's the one that takes care of the vine. Now you got to remember what the vine is about and what the husband is about. They're about one thing in this context here. They're about bearing fruit. The vine wants fruit. The husband wants fruit. That's what they want. That's what they're after. So you better get on pay, the same page with the vine and the husband. And they want the branches to bear what? Fruit. Okay, so watch here. Every branch in me. Now, you can't be a branch in the vine if you haven't trusted Christ. The only way to be a branch in the vine in Christ is to trust him as Savior, right? So we know he's talking to believers here. Every branch, you could, if it helps you understand it, every believer, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh what? Away. Okay, there's one kind of believer, a believer that bears no fruit. Now, how do we bear, what is one way that Paul said in Colossians we can bear fruit? By doing good works, good works. Well, there's a believer, obviously, that's not doing good works. But is Jesus questioning whether they're a branch or not? No, he calls them a branch, but they're not bearing fruit. 
And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. There's a second kind of believer. The first kind that bears no fruit. Second kind bears fruit. A believer that bears fruit. He purges it that it may bring forth what? More fruit. Three kinds of believers. A believer that bears no fruit or a branch that bears no fruit. A branch that bears fruit. A branch that bears more fruit. And look at verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So she be, shall you be my disciples. So there's four types of believers. Those that bear no fruit, those that bear fruit, those that bear more fruit, and those that bear much fruit. But doesn't he say you can be a branch that doesn't bear fruit? He says it. I'm not making it up. That's what he said. He says, what does he do with it? Now, a lot of preachers say he takes it, when he says he takes it away, that means uh, he sends them to hell. How many times I hear a preacher say, he takes the branch, when, he, when it says, every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Well, he explains what that means. Remember, God can never say in Scripture that you can't lose your salvation one place and then in another place come back and say you can. So what does the taking away mean? Well, he tells you in verse 6, if any man abide not in me, talking about a branch, a believer, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And watch this now, it's very important to get this. And men gather them. It didn't say, and God gathers them. It says, men gather these branches that aren't bearing fruit. He gathers them and casts them into the fire, and they are burned. Y'all, he's given a very earthly, down-to-earth farmer's illustration that any farmer or fruit uh, husband would, would know. I do this. I've got 50 blueberry bushes and I've got a bunch of fig bushes and I've got a bunch of apple trees. I guarantee you, if i got an apple tree that that branch is not bearing fruit, guess what I'm going to do to that branch? I'm going to cut it off and I'm going to take it to my burn pile. i got a big burn pile out there and we burn them every once in a while. Why? Because it's not bearing fruit. Remember, the, the vine and the vine dresser is all about bearing fruit. What's the big idea here? It doesn't in, in any way imply that the branch goes to hell. Where are you getting that from? What he's talking about is, the big idea is, you're useless. You're useless to the vine. You're useless to the vine dresser. Can a believer be useless because, to the Lord because he's not bearing fruit? Yeah. If you're not doing good works, then you're not fruitful. If you're not fruitful, the Lord can take you, elevate you to a place where you're not used by God. And that's exactly what he's telling here. That's the big idea. You can get to the place where you're not usable by God. Why? Because you're not bearing fruit as a believer. Why not? Because you're not doing good works. But did he ever question whether it was a branch or not? No. Yet how many people say, oh, but if you don't do good works, or if you don't prove that you're saved by doing good works, then you're not really saved. Not true. It's not true at all. So how are you going to address that? Look at... Titus 3, verse 14. Titus 3, verse 14. Y'all, this is becoming more and more of a prevalent issue as I talk to believers now. They're saying, yes, I believe you're not saved by any works. You can't earn your way to heaven. But if you're really saved, you will do good works. That's what they say. That is error. It's not true. It may sound all pretty, but it's not true according to Scripture. Believers should do good works, but they don't have to. Because it's not a requirement for salvation. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 14. Titus 3, verse 14. And let ours also, saved or unsaved, ours, saved, let ours also learn to maintain good works. If works were automatic for a believer, in other words, if you're saved, you will do good works, then why do you have to learn? <laughs> Why do you have to learn to maintain good works? You know, you have to learn how to do good works. You know that? It's a learning process. And you learn more of how to do good works and what the good works are by knowing Scripture. The more you know Scripture, the more good work you can know how to do. In order to know the will of God, you have to know the Word of God so you can know the will of God. In order to know how to do good works, you've got to know the Word of God so you can know what good works are. So why would, why would Paul be telling Titus, Titus, you let ours also learn to maintain good works if they just come automatic, if you automatically do good works. He wouldn't say that, would he? And let us, ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary, what's the next word? Uses. Necessary use. Works, good works have necessary uses. 
But they don't save you into eternal life. They don't keep you saved into eternal life. And they don't prove that you're saved into eternal life. They have other necessary uses besides salvation. They're for service. He says, maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not what? So can a believer be unfruitful? What would make him unfruitful? Not doing good works. See how that has nothing to do with saying, oh, if you're not, do, don't do good works. If you're not fruitful, have fruit, then you're not saved. Nowhere does it say that. Nowhere. It's not true. Okay, here's another. Number three is what I got in my notes. Why are so many believers never questioned by God about their salvation for not doing good works? Let that sink in. Why are so many believers never questioned by God about their salvation for not doing good works? And let me make it even more real to you. Why are they called carnal believers instead? Why are they called carnal believers instead? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you say that a believer has to do good works... Uh, if you say that a believer must do good works or they have to do good works in order to prove that they're saved, then you're going to have a problem explaining a carnal believer. So look at ver chap 1 Corinthians chapter, what did I say? 3, verse 1. And I, what's the next word? Is he questioning th these Corinthian believers' salvation? No, he's not questioning their salvation. You know, I think there's 13 major sins. I I'm not sure, positive on that, but I think that is th the case. Uh, there's 13 major sins that Paul brings out to these Corinthian believers in the book of Corinthians. They have 13 major sins. So you're either doing good works or you're walking in sin, right? I mean, it's, it's not hard to figure out. Either you're walking in good works or you're walking in sin. Well, they're, 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 they got a lot of sin going on here. But Paul never questions whether they're saved irregardless of how much sin they've got in their walk with the Lord. They got a lot of it. He never questions their salvation, though. Look what he says. And I, brethren, so we know they're saved. Paul doesn't even question that. Could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto what? Carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet unsaved. Is that what he said? You're unsaved. Because there's no way you can be saved and do, be doing what you're doing. Have you heard people saying that? There's no way you can be saved and be doing the ungodly things that you're doing. I hear that all the time. There's no way that you can be saved and not be doing good works. But what did he say? He didn't say they were unsaved. He said, you are yet carnal. There's the problem. The problem wasn't with their salvation. The problem was with their service towards the Lord. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are, you, are ye not carnal? How many times? He never once said they were unsaved, did he? No, he called them brethren. But he did say, here's the issue, you're carnal. So you're going to have a problem explaining that, sir, objector, who thinks that if you're saved, you will do good works. They're automatic. How do you explain a carnal believer? Here's a good quote. You ought to write this down if you're a student. You ought to write this down. I got it in my little quote book. Remember, you cannot judge others on their behavior while judging yourself by your intention. You may have all the intentions in the world to do good works as a believer, but you can't look at somebody, another believer, who's not doing good works and say, well, they can't be saved because they're not doing work, good works. Because I guarantee you somewhere along the way, you probably are going to get your eyes off the Lord and you're not going to be doing good works either at some point in your race of the Christian life. And if you're honest, you, there, there are days when you go to sleep at night when you say, man, I had a chance to do a good work and I didn't do it. Remember, for those of you who are students and writing this down, you cannot judge others on their behavior while judging yourself by your intention. Because I guarantee you the person that says, and I just did this to this, uh, a person the other day, I said, okay, you're saying that if you are saved, you will do good works. So here's the honest question I asked the person. This was at a basketball game in Jefferson. I said, do you always do good works? 
And this is what happened. Look, look, look at me. They hung their head. It says, no. I, I told him, I said, be honest. Do you always do good? He said, no. If you're honest as a believer, you'll admit you don't always do good works. Should we? Yes. But we fall short because we've got our old sinful birth. Okay, so that's enough on that. Time is ticking. Number four, how do you explain the two natures then? If a believer will automatically do good works and they have to do good works to prove that they're saved, then how in the world do you explain the two natures in the Bible? How are you going to explain that? So turning your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Why would Paul even have to write this in the Bible if believers automatically did good works? He said in chapter 5, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Everybody look up here, just really quickly. Uh, before I trusted Christ as my Savior, I had an old flesh birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's all you got. If you're lost, you got an old flesh birth. And, it, and, and that's all you've known your whole life. You've lived your whole life letting that control you. But when you heard the gospel, you trusted Christ as your Savior. The instant you believed in Christ, you get a new birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But when you trust Christ, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now you got two births, two operating systems living inside of you. Now this birth wants to control your life. You've lived your whole life letting your flesh control you. But now you got to learn to let this one control your life. So Paul says, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of that guy. You still have both inside of you, both op operating system inside of you. But if we always did good works, then would, we, would he have any need to address the flesh birth? There would need, it wouldn't even be no need to teach and preach believers about the old sinful flesh birth, that you can walk according to the works of the flesh. Look what he says the works of the flesh are. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, and on and on and on and on. Are those good works? No. Where are they coming from? Your flesh birth. So is it possible for a believer not to do good works? Yes. And it does not affect their salvation. So you got to explain that. Here's another one. Oh, well, while we're looking at this, go to, uh, is it Ephesians? Go to Ephesians, I think it is. Ephesians chapter 5, maybe? Yes, chapter 5, verse 18. Paul says, and be not drunk with wine wherein, wherein is excess. In other words, don't let that be the thing that controls you. But be filled, filled, that means controlled, by the spirit, with the Spirit. So, is it possible? Is it possible for a believer to let the old sinful nature control them? Yes. Yes. So, therefore, it must be obvious that it's possible for a believer not to be doing good works. Because where do good works come from? This birth or that birth? The flesh birth or the spirit birth? Spirit birth. Good works come from there. They don't come from here. They come from here. So, it's possible for a believer not to do good works. But not once did Paul or Jesus or anybody else in Scripture question these believers' salvation. What they were questioning was their service, their service. Okay, here's one more. How do you explain, this is number five, if you're taking notes, how do you explain chastening for believers, for believers? How do you explain chastening for believers? Why would a believer need to be chastened by God if they always do good works? Why? So... Hebrews chapter 12, if you've been in the power hour, you know I've went over this in verse by verse by verse, chastening. If you want to go to the primary passage in Scripture on chastening, you'd have to go to Hebrews chapter 12. It says in Hebrews 12 verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto, unto you, believer, as unto children, my son. You're not a son if you're not a believer. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? 
But if you, be, if you be without chastisement, whereof all believers are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. So what is he saying? I'm, rush, I'm rushing through that just a little bit because if you were in the power hour, that makes a lot of sense to you. But why would God have to chasten believers if they automatically did good works? And if works prove your salvation, then why would God have to chasten you? It doesn't make any sense. Works have nothing to do with our salvation, but they have everything to do with our service toward the Lord. Keep those words separate. So really quickly, I want to show you what are works for then? What are they for? You got to know what works are for. They are, they have a very important pur purpose. As Paul told to Titus, they have necessary uses. They do. Nothing to do with salvation, but everything to do with a believer service his walk so here's number one what are works for these are no, in no particular order of importance here but number one works are for rewards at the judgment seat of christ works are for rewards at the judgment seat of christ turn to in your bibles to first corinthians chapter three it's the primary passage on rewards for a believer and while you're turning there the judgment seat of christ is not for lost people it's only for saved people Lost people won't be at the judgment seat of Christ. It's only for believers. And believers are not judged there for their sins. Our sins got judged where? At the cross. All my sin got judged at the cross. I'll never be judged for my sin. It got judged at the cross. But it, the, the judgment seat of Christ is for a believer's works. So look at it. Pick it up with me. Chapter 3, 1 Corinthians verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble... Every man's what? Work. Talking about the two believers here now. So we see in every man's work, he's talking about every believer's work shall be made manifest, made known. For the day, what day? The judgment seat of Christ shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. Your works are going to be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work every believer's work of what sort it is, whether it was gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. You prefer gold, silver, and precious stones because when you put that in the fire, that kind of work in the fire, hey, it's going to remain. It's going to come out even more pure than when you put it in. But if it's wood, hay, and stubble, guess what it does? Poof, goes up in smoke. You have nothing left. So if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive award, reward. Now here's the point I'm driving at, y'all. If a believer must do good works, and if that's automatic, if they will do good works, or if they don't do good works, they're not really saved, that's a, that's a bunch of hogwash right there. But if a believer must do good works, if it's automatic, then why is there a loss to a believer in chapter 3, verse 15? Why is there a loss to a believer if a believer will automatically do good works? Look at what it says. If any man's work shall be burned, he, the believer, shall suffer, what's the next word? Loss. Loss of what? Reward. You're not going to get the reward you could have had. Why not? You didn't work. Or your work wasn't, uh, your motive was wrong. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer, L-O-S-S, -S, loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Why is he himself saved? Because you can't lose your salvation. He can't lose his salvation, no matter how crummy his work was. He can't lose his salvation. But he can lose reward. But if a, a believer automatically does good works, then why is there a loss of reward at the judgment seat of Christ then? You wouldn't even have to have it, would you? You just, everybody would be rewarded. <laughs> it doesn't make sense what they're saying. Okay, here's another one. Second, what are works for? Usefulness. Quickly now, I'm running out of time. Second Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. My iron is hot. I can't help it because of this. Because this is what confused me for a long time in my life. I didn't know whether I was saved or not because people were telling me that if I didn't do good works, I really wasn't saved. What a horrible thing to tell a saved person. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 19. Look, yes, 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In other words, it only makes sense that a believer should treat sin like poison and stay away from it. The problem is we don't always do that, do we? 
But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's what? Use. And prepared unto every what? Good work. So he says, get, if anything is sinful, anything is wicked, anything is iniquity, get rid of it. Because if you don't, God can't use you like he wants. The way God uses his people is through good works. He said, you'll be prepared. You'll be, you, you'll be useful in your master's hand if you're full of good works. So works are for a believer to be useful. I don't want to be unuseful. I want God to use me. But if I'm not walking in good works, how in the world is he going to use me? He can't. Look at, here's another reason. Well, we've done discussed this. And the th third reason I had was wor works are for fruitfulness. Works are for fruit fruitfulness. Here's the fourth reason. Works brings God glory. Works brings God glory. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And look at verse 14. Works brings God glory. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. says this, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Do I want other people to see my good works? Yeah, I do. Why? Because it brings God glory. That's why, because it brings God glory. So there's another reason. I, I'm kind of having to rush through these, but here's the last reason. And this is going to be a separate message. I can't wait to preach this message. What, what are works for? Here's the fifth reason. Works profits, benefits others. Works profit, benefits others. Look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Let's begin in verse 3. Uh, verse 1. Titus 3 verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, and to be ready to do every good work. Should believers be ready to do every good work? Yes. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were, in time past, were sometimes foolish and disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after, after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man, man, man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Didn't I tell you salvation is not by works? It's not. Not by works of righteousness we have done, because he's talking about salvation right here. But according to the, his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified, declared righteous by his grace, not by our works, by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now he's going to switch it. He's going to flip the switch to service. This is what say people should do, not must do, should do. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will, that thou affirm constantly, which is what I'm doing right now. I'm affirming this constantly. That they which have believed in God, saved or unsaved? Saved. In other words, that they which have believed in God, saved people, might be careful to maintain good works. Does it only make sense that a believer should be full of good works? It only makes good, it's only our reasonable service. These things, these things, maintaining good works, are good and profitable unto who? Men. Men. How in the world are you as a believer or I as a believer going to profit other people, whether it be lost people or saved people, if we're absent of good works? If you can answer that, you, you, you know something I don't know. But you're not going to be able to profit other people if you don't do good works. You're not. 
I'll close with this. This is the a next message that I want to preach. It's James chapter 2. Here's what most people run to to say that if you're saved, you will do good works. What chapter in the Bible do you think they, book and chapter? James chapter 2. They'll run to James chapter 2 and say, yeah, but Pastor John, don't you know that faith without works is dead? I will not go into that chapter now. I don't have time. But I will go into it if y'all are interested. And I'm going to go to it even if you're not. Because if you're a fisher of men, I guarantee you're going to run into this. James chapter 2 is not talking about how to be saved into eternal life. It's talking to people who already been saved into, into eternal life. They're brethren. But they're empty, 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 empty of good works. Empty, empty, empty of service. And James is never questioning their salvation. What he's questioning is their, or lack thereof, their lack of service. So we'll jump into that next time. If you really want to know what James, I'm not going to tell you what James is not talking about. I'm going to tell you what James is talking about. And I think it will bless you and help you. Hope that helps you today. If you're a fisher of men, you ought to really care deeply about what I just preached. Because I run into it. I love lost people and I love saved people. And I don't want them to be told a lie that if you're saved, you will do good works. Or in order to prove you're saved, you have to do good works. Well, just take a look in the mirror and then answer that, me that question. Because you don't do, always do good works and I don't either. But never once do I question whether somebody is saved because of their lack of good works. Because good works don't save anybody. I hope I got that point. I hope you picked up what I was putting down today. I hope you so. It matters. It matters if you care about souls. Now, look up here really quickly. If you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, will you do that? Will you do that? If you don't have salvation, none of this else is going to matter anyway. You can be saved into eternal life this very instant if you'll do the one thing that guarantees you that. I'm going to let that hand represent you and me and everybody in the world. That's us. I'm going to let that phone represent sin. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. That's what we are. Now, God loves sinners, but he hates our sin. Now, I'm going to let that hand represent God. God is perfect. He doesn't have any sin. The problem with sin is not with God. It's with who? Us. And here's the problem. Your ugly sin and my ugly sin separates us from a holy God. He wants us to be connected to him, not separated, but sin messed the, everything in the picture up between us and a God who loves us. We're separated from God. And since we've all sinned, we all got to pay the same price tag. But there's only one price tag for sin. It's death. Nothing else will pay for sin. Good works won't pay for sin. Not a list. Not your own righteousness. It takes death to pay for sin. And all that means is we deserve to go to hell to pay for it. But God didn't want us to make that death payment. He wants us to go to, he uh, to heaven, not hell. To heaven, not hell. He wants us to go there. But to go to heaven, we have to be perfect, as righteous as God. But the problem is, nobody is perfect. Being good won't get you into God's perfect heaven. You've got to be perfect. But the problem is, we're all busted with sin. And no amount of good deeds, good works can save us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So no matter how many works you do, it won't save you, it won't keep you saved, and it won't prove that you're saved. Because works don't save you. Why? Because it's not death. It takes death to pay for sin. Now, I'm going to let that hand represent Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. He is. This is what he did. He came down from his perfect heaven. He had no sin. He didn't have to die. We had the sin. We deserve to die and be separated from him. But Jesus didn't want that for you and me. He loved you that much. So Jesus took all your sin, all my sin, off of us onto himself. Now, we don't have the sin. He does. And he died on the cross. He paid for every man's sin. Past, present, future. They all got paid. Why? Because he didn't want us to go to hell to pay for it ourselves. So he paid it for us on the cross. And now that we don't have anything left to pay, it's a gift. It's free. Going to heaven is free. It's a gift. And he was buried and he rose from the dead. He's in heaven today. He said, if you'll do one thing, because there's only one thing you can do. We don't have anything else. If you'll just believe in Christ, trust that he died for you. God will give you that moment you trust in him as a free gift, everlasting life. And once you have everlasting life, you can never lose it. It's yours forever. And that's based upon not a single work that you or I have done. It's based upon the work that Jesus did on that cross. And now that I am saved into eternal life, yes, I should do good works. But the honest truth is, as we clearly see, sometimes we don't as believers. And I'm glad that doesn't annul my salvation or determine it. It's, our salvation is not contingent or conditional upon whether we do good works or not.